Thank you, Eve. Uh, so I'm Kevin Larson. I am going to be talking about a project called Learning Tools for OneNote. Uh, it is not done entirely by me. This is a collaboration of all of the advanced reading technologies team uh, and the learning tools team at Microsoft. And I'm going to, uh, in the next slide, is a video, and I'm going to let the kids who are using it uh, introduce this. The of education is to create possibility. It was a little hard for me. People laugh whenever I read sometimes. Well, they knew how to read, and I didn't. I will never be good at reading. I will probably be held back again. It highlights the words to know where I am. When it's reading, I see spaces between the words. And it's easy to focus on. The first time I actually could read that book, I was proud of myself. I was very proud of myself. Good job, Joey. When technology and education come together, possibility becomes reality. I want to read every book in here. So I'm going to talk about three features that are going into learning tools. And each of these things uh, involve making uh, significant changes to what typography looks like today. And before talking about each of them, I want to make a quick reminder that uh, back in the 6th century, typography looked pretty different than it does today. This is a document that shows no word spaces, which is how all documents appeared at the time. Uh, and uh, there was no desire to have word spaces. When they finally came around as an idea, it took a number of centuries for them to become widely adopted because people didn't think that I really needed it. Um, and today, if I were to take word spaces away from you guys, everyone here who is a very good reader would have no problems reading. It would reduce your reading speed by about 10%, but you could absolutely do it. Um, but it would make it significantly harder to learn to read. Uh, and so these are some ideas that, are, uh, that I'm going to talk about have some similarity to this kind of idea of making a change to typography, like adding a word space. All right, so this first one uh, is going to involve a reading test on your part. What I'm going to do is put a word up on screen, and out loud, you guys are going to read that word as fast as you can. Are you ready? Okay. Three, two, one, go. I didn't hear a single person read that. So this, this is a famous train station in Wales. Uh, it's a real word, and yeah, I would struggle to read it too. Uh, but what if I do this to the word? Suddenly you have a chance of reading it. If I forced you to read this, it's in Welsh, so the sounds are a little bit different than what you're going to be used to in your native language, but you've got a shot at it. Uh, so what I'm doing here is marking up the word by syllable. Uh, and kids come across essentially what's a word like this every day, that uh, kids through the primary school years are learning about 3,000 new words a year or about eight new words a day. Uh, many of these are going to be two- and three-syllable words, and they might as well be a Welsh train station, because that's going to be a challenge. And so as soon as you mark up the words with syllables, suddenly you've got something that you can use, that you're just reading a syllable at a time and not this whole large word. Uh, <clears throat> and this makes it possible to read words that you wouldn't be able to read easily otherwise, and it improves reading speed uh, for words that you already do know how to read. Uh, so it's a super benefit for early readers, for kids. Uh, and we're not the first to come up with this idea that uh, it turns out that all uh, children's books in Russia come broken up uh, by syllable. This is a very common thing to do there, and there's even an aphorism there about uh, reading by syllables means something that's super simple to do. Uh, and so we're just bringing that to, uh, to other languages. The second idea uh, is one that uh, I talked about at Atypi in Barcelona. So if you were at that talk, um, 
This will be a quick repeat. Sorry about that. Uh, the idea here is uh, syntax is something that you've got to figure out as you're reading. So this is a sentence fragment. Uh, the girl knew the answer. When you're reading a sentence, what you do is you read word by word by word, uh, and you process that sentence as you go. So in this sentence, you've read the first five words of the sentence. The girl knew the answer. Um, at this point in the sentence, you're, you're trying to imagine what's going to happen. And so I'm imagining hey, there's a girl in a classroom, and she knows the answer. And maybe she's going to raise her hand to get the teacher to call on her to answer the question. But you keep reading the sentence, and you find out that, and my line layout has changed here. Sorry. Uh, you keep reading the sentence, and you find out the sentence is actually, the girl knew the answer was wrong. So the girl doesn't know the answer. The girl knows this more complex thing, that the answer was wrong. Uh, and this is a standard kind of sentence in English that, that it's called a garden path sentence. You read it, and as you're going, you think it's going to have one interpretation, and then it changes. Now, if I'm speaking this sentence to you, I'm going to convey additional information to help you disambiguate it. So I'm not going to say, the girl knew the answer was wrong. If I said it like that, you would absolutely misinterpret it. But if I say the girl knew the answer was wrong, you'll interpret it correctly. So <clears throat> we can take this information that currently exists in the speech stream and try to add it to the text stream. So here's an example of that where we've taken this subordinate clause, the answer was wrong, and put it into brackets. And the bracket has changed, sorry. Um, so it's the girl knew that the answer was wrong. Uh, and when you do this, it turns out that people are able to understand this markup without any training whatsoever. Uh, that processing syntax is something that you have to do in order to understand a sentence. Uh, and, and this kind of markup seems to be incredibly intuitive. And it improves reading comprehension by about 10%, which is a huge number. Um, this has been studied, this is not a new finding. Uh, this was initially studied in the 1950s, shown to be a benefit in the 1960s. It was tested again, shown to be a benefit. 70s, 80s, 2000s, it keeps getting tested, and everyone says, oh yeah, no, this is definitely a benefit, but we haven't really had ways of automating this before. So all we're doing is automating a, a finding that's already known in the literature. Uh, so that's the second feature that, uh, that is in learning tools that I'm talking about. And then the third one is uh, going to be a little more complex to explain. And this is work that we're doing on dyslexia. Um, so over the last 40 years, the main research on dyslexia uh, has been around phonology, that, that dyslexia is a phonological deficit, and in order to... Uh, help kids with dyslexia, there's a lot of work done on how to train phonology. Uh, and very little uh, impact on visual aspects. So letter flipping was an idea that existed in the 1920s that, uh, that, doesn't, that hasn't panned out. Uh, and so fonts that have letter flipping are not uh, likely to work. Uh, but a new theory that's come along in the last 10 years and is still very controversial uh, is called the magnocellular deficit hypothesis. And the idea here is, do I have a cursor? No. Uh, the idea here is that there are two paths that go from vision. So this is your brain. Your eyes are on the left side of this picture. Uh, what happens when you see information is it goes from the eyes to the back of the brain in V1. Uh, and then from there, the vision information kind of goes down two paths in order to get processed. One is the uh, ventral pathway, which is along the bottom of the brain, we'll call it. Uh, and along this bottom path is where we're going to do recognition of objects. So recognizing letters, for instance, is going to happen along this bottom path. Uh, along the top path, the dorsal pathway, going towards the top of the brain, is the where pathway, or where objects are. Uh, and there's a bunch of research indicating that, that dyslexics have issues in this where pathway. Uh, and so uh, while the letters are being recognized on this bottom pathway, where the letters are is being processed in this upper pathway that may have problems. Now, uh, I'm going to do a quick demo to show you 
uh, one of the pieces of information that suggests that this wear pathway is a problem. It's something called crowding. Um, and what you're going to do in this demo is look at the minus sign up on screen. And very quickly, I am going to present something over on this side. And it's either going to be one object or three objects. And those objects might be letters, or they might be something else entirely. Uh, your task is to identify the middle object. If it's just one object, it's identify that one. If it's three, identify the middle object. But you've got to be looking at the minus sign when I do this, OK? All right. <clears throat> uh, and we're just doing this by me pressing buttons, so the timing isn't controlled, but that'll be OK. Are you guys ready? Three, two, one. R. R. Good, OK. We're going to do four of these. Three, two, one. R, OK. Three, two, one. Call out some answers. I heard pretzel, I heard pizza, I heard taco, burrito, what? Brown and red. Brown and red. OK. All right, last one. Three, two, one. Hamburger. Hamburger. Very good. All right, so what you were looking at, in all cases, you were seeing uh, the minus sign in the same place and these objects appearing the same distance away. So either you were getting the R by itself or the ARM, or you're getting hamburger by itself, or pretzel hamburger pizza. And what I hope you guys found is that it was a lot easier to recognize the object when it was just one than three. Did everyone find that? Yes. yes. OK, good. So that is crowding. Everybody has crowding. So you've got the same visual information for the R and hamburger, whether or not there's anything around it. But by having those flankers next to it, it makes it harder to recognize the object, even though you haven't actually lost any visual information. Um, everyone has that phenomenon. The finding, though, has been that dyslexics have this to a greater degree than other people. Uh, and so people took that information and said, oh, OK, if dyslexics are having trouble with this crowding, maybe we can do something simple to reduce crowding. And so an idea by uh, Marco Focchietti and, sorry, Marco Zorzi and Andre Focchietti out of Italy said, all right, how about if we increase the letter, word, and line spacing? Will that help dyslexic readers? And so they tested this and found a absolutely huge advantage. They found that uh, it increased reading speed by 10% in that group and decreased the number of reading errors they made by 50% crazy finding that everyone said, oh, wow, we've got to go look at this. And a dozen different labs around the world went off and researched this. Our team uh, worked with the Hamlin Robbins School in Seattle and looked at this. And some labs were able to replicate this. And other labs, including ours, uh, we were not able to replicate this. And so there was something funny going on. And since then, since this finding, we've started working with Jason Yateman at UW, and we think we've figured out what's going on. We think what's happening is that there are subgroups within dyslexics, and there is a subgroup that has this crowding problem. And if we do this kind of crowding test that I showed you, uh, the people that show the uh, most drastic problems with crowding benefit from having this kind of spacing. And if you don't have a drastic crowding problem, you don't benefit from the spacing. So what we've done is we've added this feature to our tool. And uh, for kids that have a crowding problem, this is going to be a huge benefit. But that's going to be a smaller number than the people with dyslexia. All right, so next I am going to show you what our tool looks like. Um, has anyone heard of OneNote before? No? A few people? OK, so OneNote is a uh, newer Office product. It's been, it's been part of the Office suite for several years now, but it's not, uh, not as well known as Word and Excel. Uh, it's a note-taking application um, and has, has a very rich feature set of all kinds of, of uh, notebook support, note-taking, handwriting notes. You can throw all kinds of content into it. Um, and it's 
One of the places that it's popular is in schools, and there's a feature called uh, classroom notebooks where a teacher can uh, make a notebook that has all the material they want to use in their classroom and can have homework assignments in it, and kids can uh, do the homework assignments within OneNote, and the teachers can immediately see it and provide feedback, and they can use the OneNote to uh, communicate directly rather than sending paper back and forth. Uh, and so it's popular in classes. And so what we've done is we've taken this complex tool and we've added a reading mode to it, which is available uh, under learning tools up there at the top. And so if you go to learning tools and you turn on the immersive reader, uh, it takes that page and gives it a, a simplified look like this. So we've stripped away all of the, the Chrome and made a, uh, a reading mode. This part isn't rocket science. Um, one of the big features in it is this big play button at the bottom. Uh, this is a, this is a text-to-speech uh, button, so it starts reading you the text. Uh, super popular. Um, and then shows you the word that, you're, that it's reading to you, so you can follow along. So it's a, it's a good crutch for kids in the younger grades that have given up on reading and want it read to them. Um, so the features that, in order to get to each of the features that I've talked about, uh, there are three buttons up at the top here, and if you click on the A, you get uh, all of the standard text features that you'd expect in a reading mode, so you can control the size. The second one is the one that gives you the spacing mode, so you click on the large spacing, and it gives you the large spacing. And one of the cool things uh, about this is that we've called it spacing and not dyslexic mode. Turns out if you call something by the name of a disease, uh, kids don't want to use it. And so there's all kinds of tools on the market that are for, here's a tool for dyslexic, here's a tool for dysgraphic, and nobody wants to be the kid that has the special tool. So this is just a feature within OneNote that classes are already using, and they can turn on extra spacing if that helps them. And we're not stigmatizing it by giving it a bad name. Uh, turns out that's very valuable. Uh, so you click on spacing, and then it takes that same page, and it lays it out like this. Yay. Uh, the second button, uh, you press on that, and it gives you a bunch of additional tools. Uh, syllables, you click syllables, and it takes the whole page and marks up all the words with the syllable marks. It's a version one product, and I'm not going to say there aren't bugs. There are bugs. Uh, yeah, and they're definitely, yeah. We'll work that out. Uh, and then if you want the syntax markup, you press comprehension. That's the top one, and it says, oh, OK, here, I'll take this whole thing, and I'll automatically uh, analyze this document and mark it up with all the syntactic features. Um, and, of course, all three of these things and many other things can be turned on all at the same time. So if you want syllables, you want syntax, and you want spacing, you can do that. You can have whatever features you need. Um, and that is, uh, that is all the information I have for you. Uh, I'm going to end this by... Uh, playing a interview with a teacher, Laura Pittman, who is using this in her class. Uh, and I would be happy to take the extra time that's left before the next speaker for questions. Uh, and I'm about to play the video. Cool? Here is Lauren Pittman. What did we start talking about yesterday, guys? I am a resource special education teacher. I target groups of students who need intervention for either reading, language arts, or math. These are kids that struggle every day. And to watch them grow and learn and have those aha moments oh, now I get it. is so rewarding to me and it just makes my heart soar. We have ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia. I have a student who reads on a third grade level, but then I have a student who reads on a kindergarten level, and I have to find a way to bridge the gap. We've been using OneNote since the beginning of this school year. Even in this short amount of time that we've had it, it's been completely transformational. When we first started using OneNote, I thought, okay, this is gonna take us a while to get going, and you know, we're gonna have to learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. Three days. It took them three days to master 
OneNote. I have a dyslexic student who's also dysgraphic. He still reads on a kindergarten level. You know, he's 10 years old, he's still learning sight words. And, you know, he would tell me all the time that he was stupid. When we started the school year, he read four words per minute. For the longest time, I struggled with how to help him. And when we got the learning tools with the immersive reader, he went to 22 words per minute. I never thought in one calendar school year that we would even get into double digits. And he's at 22 words per minute and he stayed there. For my students especially, it's really transformed their educational experience. I don't know what next year will look like. I don't know what our possibilities are because in my wildest dreams, I never thought this would be what it is. You know, the sky's the limit. Thank you, I am proud of this work. There's a question. I'm just going to shout it. I'll read. Oh, there's a microphone. OK. Oh, sorry. There was one in the back, but we'll start with John. As, as you know, I think very highly of this work. I, when I first saw it, I had one question of why in OneNote there's only the radical spacing or regular spacing. And I particularly thought that because there is another option there for changing themes, so you could end up with reversed out type. I'm surprised there isn't at least an intermediate one. I don't, so we didn't do that because I don't have data on an intermediate spacing distance being effective, but that is certainly something that has been discussed. Hey. Um, I'm wondering how you're deciding on the emphasis words for sentences. Um, yeah. The, so we're not putting emphasis words uh, okay. in this. What we're doing, so what we're trying to do is uh, show two syntactic marks. One, the divide between subject and predicate, and we've chosen to do that, uh, in this version at least, by highlighting the verb, which is usually going to be the boundary between subject and predicate. And then the second division that we're trying to show are subordinate clauses, and that's what we're marking off with the brackets. Thanks. Is there documentation, uh, any public paper or anything that's describing these different techniques you have that I could look into more? Uh, for syntax, I can provide you at least a dozen papers that talk about this idea. The syllables work, and I should have called this out earlier, is work uh, that we did in collaboration with Yuchi Tai at Pacific University that is documented in a white paper on her website. Uh, the spacing is also, I can point you to a dozen papers on the topic. That's, that is a hot research topic right now where the information certainly will be changing in the next five years. Thanks. You remember that second slide where you show the train station, the Welsh uh, train station the Welsh divided train station, by sure. syllables? So Vincent Connard on Twitter wants to know what font is that? I think I use Kandara in all of my slides, but let me pull it up. Oh, because this is conversion. Yeah, so we've had my slides were converted from PC to Mac, so some things have happened. Sorry. Ebes thinks it's trebuchet. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, how many languages are supported? Just English? Uh, at the m so for the learning tools for OneNote, it is English only. Uh, it is rolling out some of these features, not all of these features, are starting to roll out into other Office products. So if you go to the online versions of Word and Outlook, 
you will find the spacing modes and the syllables, and they may be supported for all languages that Office supports. Including Japanese. Well, uh, <laughs> correct. For, <laughs> uh, for, well, for the languages that it makes sense for. So for spacing, uh, we're not doing it for the Arabic or Indic languages, for instance. But we are investigating it. Uh, and so there are some techniques that might apply to do it for other languages. But yes, for all of these features, uh, there's a lot of interesting work to be done to get this to work across many different languages. Any more questions? Raise your hand. Once, twice. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much.